Sam cool. Smith. Um, pleasure, mate. Also, we met before. Indeed. With Team Rubicon. Mm-hmm. And I assumed that you were military. Nope, no Maybe military not. background. Which begs the question. So, Team Rubicon UK is obviously a predominantly ex military volunteers. So, how did you become involved with TR then? So, I did a master's in international disaster management, finished in about 2014, 2015. And then it was just desperate to get into the sector. Always wanted to do disaster response, more so than development, uh, which is quite niche in the UK. There are a lot more development organizations than there are disaster response. And I was always much more keen for that, that side of life. Um, so I'd done some development work out in Nepal for five months. And then I heard about this place. So uh, one of the old CEOs, John Leach, um, who had been working in TR, uh, came and told me about the place, said I could come down and intern, live in headquarters uh, in deepest, darkest Wilshire, and check the place out. Um, so I came down, that was 2017. Things were a lot leaner then. And um, yeah, just fell in love with it. Completely fell in love with the concept, the idea, which was quite an interesting one for me. So on my master's, there was quite a lot of talk about civ mill coordination. And there was an odd uh, standoffish nature and a little bit of a, a fear around the blending of humanitarian organizations and military. And part of that is around the humanitarian principles of independence. And so it's often seen that the military may have their own bias. And so often humanitarian organizations struggle to work around that when they're operating in a disaster response. But the concept of Team Rubicon, which was working with veterans who are not necessarily attached to a military response, but have a military background, was fascinating for me. Um, because it, in essence, is taking people who have a background of core skills. They are used to operating in austere environments. They have phenomenal skill sets. They're used to working in high-performing teams. And the attitude of going and getting something done outside of talking about it. And I was kind of sick of humanitarian theory. And seeing all of these problems and not a lot actually being done was a very refreshing space to come into where you were combining humanitarian context and knowledge of the sector with people who just go and get things done and have this incredible raw skill set and sense of service above self and actually want to go and make things happen and be proactive in the sector. So that was a really nice natural fit for me and uh, I've been hooked on it ever since. Oh, cool. Oh, cool. It, that's one of the things that interests me. Team Rubicon. I wasn't aware of it until end of 2018 yep. when I had Sharpie on the podcast and I yep. had Paul Gadonis on the podcast um, and then subsequently a bunch of other TR volunteers like Bags and people like that, Chris Shirley. Mm-hmm. Um, but when I, what interested me was what I felt fascinating when I deployed, so I deployed to Wazambi yep. with you guys, which was an amazing experience. Two of the, two of the things that I found was fantastic explanation myself was when, I, when as soon as so I got the go, you, you deploy, mm-hmm. my mind switched back into operational. And not in a go and kill people kind of way. Yep. Operational and that. Okay, purpose, mission. Yep. It, it, Clear goal. Okay. Put me up a level in terms of mindset. Yep. Back away, you still were deploying things like, you don't get the opportunity. Mm-hmm. Second thing was, when I hit the ground in Mozambique, I discovered that my team leader was actually a civilian. Mm-hmm. I was like 24 years old. 24, yep. 23 to Angus. 23, yep. 24 years old. A majority of the team, six man team, was civvies. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but that's when I first realized that, okay, the, 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 the value in having a broad range of backgrounds and experience yeah. in the team is huge, regardless of the organization. I never would have thought in that environment that there could be benefit to having people who are not so military, yeah. working with military in that kind of austere environment. However, it was absolutely fantastic. And I learned, I learned a lot there. I learned a lot on the ground from, from those people. Yeah. You know, and a 24 year old team leader. It was an eye opener. What an awesome game. He was fantastic. Everyone learned a bit about each other. Which leads me on to TR is predominantly ex military. Yeah. But it's not entirely. So, is it is the value in having that mix of civilian non military? Is, is that a demonstrable thing that you try and pass on to other organizations? I think it's huge. I think, so first of all, I've learned a ton from anyone who's had a military background because I have zero myself Um, and in terms of I think the blend is so so important because so for example I I run the um, operational leadership course at Team Rubicon and that really panicked me at the beginning because as you said (laughs) I'm a 27 year old non-ex-military and I'm here to talk to people about leadership who have 
more leadership experience than I have come near. And really what it was about for me was not teaching. You can't teach people leadership in, in five days, but you can contextualize it to TR and what we're after and what the humanitarian space brings. And that's my background and knowledge set is, is the humanitarian sector. So what I learned was if I wasn't trying to teach people leadership, but instead share knowledge about you have all the leadership experience and background from your previous life. How do you apply that in this context? And that was where I found I had credibility and we had this mutual respect where people were able to gain something from me and I gained a huge amount from them. And really leadership for me is facilitating the skill set of a team that you have. And so that encompasses true diversity and a team who's not got this groupthink mindset and has these different backgrounds where you have somebody who's... Um, take Caroline O'Callaghan. She was um, Matthew O'Callaghan is one of our interns. Caroline is his mother who signed up and was deployed out to Dorian. She has no military background. She, um, I believe, worked in finance. Which where was Dorian? Uh, it was out in the Bahamas. Oh yeah. Um, back end of last year, and she just had the most <laughs> incredible. It was over October, I think, October oh. November. She just had the most incredible human nature ability to connect with people who'd had their worst day. And so you had other members of her team who had this incredible hard skill experience, engineers, people who'd worked in the military their entire lives and were able to problem solve on the logistics front. But without her being able to understand the needs of the community and really connect with these people, find out exactly what they needed, feed that back to then let these incredible logisticians go and move this aid from being stuck in warehouses to those people who needed it most. That combination of skill set between hard and soft skills, where people often think if they're coming to TR, they need to come with this background of being either a medic, a marine, somebody who's got hard skills, helicopter pilot, whatever it might be. Actually, that combination of the hard and soft skills is something I find incredibly potent and has worked time and time again, in my experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, uh, where, uh, have you managed to play that? Uh, so, I was in um, Sierra Leone. Uh, Indonesia and Mozambique. So I went to Mozambique as part of the DRR, Disaster Risk Reduction Operation, post year um, wave, okay. where we were going back looking at sustainable rebuild, um, just helping out the school and orphanage, um, rebuilding them back better so that the roofs wouldn't come off if, uh, if another disaster ripped through. I haven't been out in a response. My predominant skill set and where I add most value is, is in the mission up. So my job there is the operations manager. And I'm effectively scanning and tracking, uh, delivering training building teams, selecting teams to then go out and respond to these things, and then providing overwatch back from HQ. Um, so you'll have been chatting to me back and forth while you're yeah. out and deployed. <laughs> um, tracking our outputs, what are we achieving, doing that monitoring piece so that we can see where we need to facilitate teams with more resource, um, or change things around, however it might be, just to best support our teams out in the field. Can you, um, for the benefit of people watching, explain the difference between disaster relief Response and disaster risk reduction. Yeah, so response is immediate. So um, you get that first sort of 72 hour period where you're into uh, urban search and rescue, really. Um, and that is that is not our particular skill set. Um, so what we do is we normally aim to be on the ground within 24, 48 hours to establish um, connections with whoever's running the response. So it might be into the UN cluster system, if the UN are running the response or emergency operations centers that will be run by the national government, National Department for Disaster Management. So we plug in uh, and we explain who we are, what we can do, uh, and we look to see how we can best facilitate a response and plug the gaps. So really, in Mozambique, for example, a lot of the response effort was focused around Bira, and it was uh, missing the populations who were in remote area communities who hadn't been seen yet, hadn't been needs assessed, and our skill set was deploying small teams who were uh, self-sustaining. Again, back to the military background, people are well used to living in tents, tarps, eating rations, purifying their own water, looking after themselves. So that was our niche there. Um, and we are looking to then provide that immediate life support. Last mile logistics, move aid from being clogged up in airports, seaports, warehouses, getting it to the people most in need who haven't been seen yet, haven't received any aid. That is our area in the response phase. And then we will look to phase out and hand over to the bigger development organizations as they come into the recovery phase. Uh, and that more long-term development of a country that can take years. The DRR programs, Disaster Risk Reduction, is looking at areas of the world that are highly exposed to disaster and helping build their capacity and resilience. 
so that when another disaster does come along, uh, they are better prepared. That obviously not only reduces the risk to life immediately for them, um, but also means that you're sharing skills, knowledge, and it also is a good way of building access and contacts. So whenever there's a disaster, you get a coordination issue where you have lots of NGOs trying to help, and it's all coming from a good place. But having an understanding of the country, their culture, their values, how they do things, who operates in that space prior to deploying, not only helps build trust with the country that is uh, been affected by the disaster, but also helps build a working understanding um, of how to operate. So, for example, we've got a team out in Nepal right now doing capacity building training with the Gurkha Welfare Trust. So they have area welfare centers all over Nepal in remote areas. We're training their area welfare managers on uh, instant management, uh, basic wilderness med, uh, and swift water rescue. So every time they get a seasonal monsoon flooding in remote communities, it's a way of helping those communities again build capacity to respond immediately, um, but also to operate in Nepal anytime there's a, a major disaster, take the 2015 earthquake, you have to have a local partner. And that's a really, really good practice as we start to see the disaster response in general becoming more regulated so that you get less of what happened in Haiti 2010, where all these NGOs turned up and they're duplicating work because uh, if you have your own, your own NGO, you arrive out to a community in Haiti and you do a needs assessment. And then the next day, my NGO arrives and we do a needs assessment. And the next day, think what that does to a community who've just had the worst day of their life, lost family, lost friends, lost their home. And people keep coming to assess their needs and ask what they need, but aid hasn't come yet. That has a real impact on mental health and well-being. And so the importance of having a joined up, collaborative, coordinated response is so critical that working with local partners is a really, really key piece um, and, and something that we look to do, which is part of why we do those disaster risk reduction programs, not only to build capacity, but also to build a working relationship and understanding so that whenever we do get the call, if they have the unfortunate event of a major disaster, we understand how they operate and we make sure that we're not duplicating effort and we're doing the best we can to facilitate the national response because really it is their country and it is their response. Yeah, that's one of the things. Oh, yeah, wrap this up there, but that's one of the things. So, just go back to Mozambique. That, that deployment that is one of the most amazing things I've ever done. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the most feel good things I've ever done um, for a bunch of reasons. So, next when I treated a lot of operations, it was the closest thing I get to being a background operation, yeah. which we all miss. But on the flip side, doing we just there to help. We just there to help. So, which, well, that's arguably what you do anyway. Military yeah. operations, but here it's it's much more on the humanitarian, well, entirely the humanitarian side. Um, and plus, when you're in those teams, very much autonomous. You give us direction from the op center or wherever it is. You give us direction, and it's down to team leader and the team decide what we're going to do. And that's not low risk, yeah. you know I mean? especially in uh, in Mozambique there. But one of the things I noticed back in the op center was the difference with team control and the attitude you have with um, that information sharing, information for the, for the greater good, for the national yeah. response, for the NGO response. Is that what that meant? Is that Gone, the reputation with um, for, because we've got to see what's built on. It's about everyone coming together, we're all here to help out. It's not about going to or somewhere globally. And what it means is resources are better allocated. You don't get people duplicating what goes on. Um, and what was it going with that? Where was it going with that? It's like someone walking in the Sorry. Um, but it really yeah, on, it's um, a It's a force multiplier for the sector. Absolutely. And it's about integrity. Because for a lot of people, this non-joined up coordinated approach is about having their own mandate. We generate funding to deliver this aid. So with that funding, we purchase this aid, we move it into country, and we deliver it to, <coughs> although people in need, maybe the most accessible. Our mandate is now complete, and we leave. That is the old approach that has led to people not being met with their needs, to a non-joined up response, to the chaos that was seen in Haiti 2010. And so having an attitude where we use people, people is our asset. People with problem-solving skills and integrity that we want to make a overall benefit to the people affected by disaster is all about being a force multiplier, sharing information. So our four core capabilities, instant management, situational awareness, um, life support, and last mile logistics. Life support is the sexy one that people want to fundraise because you can compute it. It's basically delivering water, food, shelter, power, communications. People get that. 
instant management, plugging yourself into the cluster systems that coordinate these responses. That is harder to understand as a fundraiser, but as a force multiplier to an overall coordinated response has massive impact. The WASH cluster that uh, Laura Perry was plugged into yeah. for about a month in Mozambique, that impacted 4 million people because that is they are coordinating the entire response for, for Mozambique in terms of water supply. Um, situational awareness, going and doing those rackies, those needs assessments of communities that haven't been reached yet, jumping in a helicopter, getting out to a community that hasn't been seen, passing that information back to someone like Laura in that cluster system to ensure that those people's needs are prioritized and not just missed because they're too hard to reach, too hard to get to. That all adds to a better coordinated response. And it, for partners, for other organizations who've got aid stuck in warehouses, that information is critical because without it, their aid goes to people that are easiest to reach, not the people that are most in need. And everybody wants to reach people most in need. They just don't have, um, or there isn't as much of, of our organization's mindset uh, to help get that information out. So that is core to what we do, is that integrity piece of making sure that we are providing situational awareness for everybody, sharing information, being collaborative, and getting the most out of, out of everybody that's there, because we're all there for the same thing at the end of the day, make people's lives better. And hopefully that actually rubs off from other, other NGOs. It certainly was, I know that there. Um, because they sold it. Anyway, um, nothing about that. I, I apologise for the sound of cars going outside with um, <laughs> Mission Motorsport event. So thank you to Mission Motorsport for inviting us down for this. Uh, and apologies for the noise. That's fast cars going down. Right by the, right by the, uh, the grid. Silverstone. The grid. Yeah, right by Silverstone, <laughs> the grid. So everything's flying past. It sounds alright. Right. right. Uh, where can people find out more about Team Rubicon? Uh, on the website, uh, teamrubiconuk.org, you can sign up to be a volunteer. If some of what we've talked about sounds like it grips you and it's something you want to get involved with, um, or again, you can you can donate on that website, you can look at some of the operations that we've done, and any new one that comes up will come onto that website and you can donate to support us. Really appreciate it. Perfect. Your pleasure, mate. Yeah, pleasure to chat, as always. Thank you.